Okay, welcome back to Fast Ship Performance then. My name is Tim Davies and today we're going to look at a MiG-23 ejection that happened in North America yesterday. Okay, so what we do then guys, we jump straight into a video I think. Before we do that though, um, I just want to say that the Americans uh, do have a history of flying some what we would consider in the rest of Europe maybe very uh, dated aircraft in the air show kind of setting so what i'm going to do then from my experience as a fast jet instructor as you can see on here is talk a little bit about this this aircraft was operating under the experimental exhibition category which limits what it can do but does allow it to fly over populated areas with crowds and if you're an american guy and you've got more information on that then the comments is a great place to post information because i want to get this video out i've got to teach in about two hours in my own flight school shadowlands and i really just need to kind of just run through this as quickly as i possibly can so the first thing we're going to look at then is this kind of rear aspect of the aircraft. You can see the wings are fully forward. I think that's 16 degrees. This aircraft is a single engine aircraft. It's um, very similar to what would be the J-75 used on the F-105, F-106. It's called an R-35 engine, uh, very reliable engine. And it does sound like the engine is running when this aircraft, uh, when, the, when the crew of this aircraft leave. Now, this is a twin cockpit variant of the MiG-23. The MiG-23 was a single cockpit aircraft as an interdiction strike aircraft primarily this was the end of what we call the first generation as well i know i'm talking let me hide myself let me play the film Okay, this is the aircraft in question then. You can see from that last film, there were two parachutes that came out of the aircraft. I believe the guy in the back of it, I made some hit notes here, could have been a guy called Will Ward who owns an ML variant of this aircraft, which is a single cockpit. Now, something to note is you can see it is a two cockpit variant. And you can see there's a guy there at the front, doesn't have a mask on, that flies mask less with a boom mic on this. That chap in there then is going to be a Dan Flyer, and, and in the, a filer, sorry, and in the back here, it looks like you've got a chap here, which is probably Will Ward. As I said, he owns his own um, ML variant, single seat variant of this aircraft. So you did see two parachutes come out of that aircraft, and there were two bangs, like a bang, bang. If you ever see a modern aircraft ejection, you may hear a bang and a whoosh. And that's because modern aircraft have a rocket assisted seat. This jet had a bang seat it was a cartridge that just fired you out got you clear very retro very dated seat and i'm suspecting there will be some injuries from an ejection of this sort so what we do guys run through a few pictures this is actually the aircraft there you can see it's a reheated engine it's the as i said it was the r35 turbojet not turbofan very reliable engine actually in this particular aircraft again the end of the first generation it produced about eighteen thousand pounds worth of thrust uh, when it was dry i.e not in reheat and about twenty eight thousand pounds of thrust within reheat the speed this aircraft could get up to then was around about mark 2.3 however you're not allowed to do that over land uh, in the continental united states unless you're within some specific test range interestingly enough the red eagle squadron also flew this aircraft in fact they lost two pilots flying the mig 23 that they'd captured on the 447 7th test squadron that operated out of tony Par test range um, back in the day they used to present this uh, against pilots coming out of nellis i think it was in the test and evaluation kind of role pretty reliable aircraft especially with the engine so i'm not thinking this was necessarily an engine issue i haven't been able to find out whether this aircraft has a ram air turbine but uh to be fair it does have a compressor called the ts21 that does start the r35 engine in about uh five to 15 seconds it's a pretty good system okay here's another angle So people don't react well to things like this so they've never seen it before so you have this kind of stress response and as you can see that now i've been involved in flying for a long time it's like yeah jet in apartment building 
questions. However, no one else was killed. Well, no one was killed. Sorry, no one was killed here. The pilots are uh, both recovering, apparently. And, of course, the jet was destroyed. It actually went into the parking lot area, I believe, of the, uh, the apartment building. So we'll do one more film then. I'm just going to talk a little bit about ejection uh, parameters and a little bit about uh, where you want to put the jet if you are going to leave an airplane such as this. So I'm going to come back in now, get criticised for being on my own videos, but that's just YouTube, isn't it? You're going to get that. Let's rewind this a little bit and then let's talk a little bit about ejection parameters. Now, the issue being here, guys, is there's no good way to do this. Uh, as I said, I couldn't find out whether this airplane does have what we call a ram air turbine. A ram air turbine with an engine failure is something that pops out like a little windmill at the back of the jet, starts spinning and gives you enough hydraulic pressure to still control the aircraft. It might allow then for a relight. However, the R35 engine is, is a really solid engine. Um, there's not much else I've got on it here, because there was nothing really that anyone was saying that was against this aircraft engine. It was a very solid engine. Uh, the R27, R29 that preceded it were not like that. But this engine was wrapped in titanium. So any kind of um, under G or your rates or spinning, the older engines could bend the compressor shaft, which would throw compressor blades through the actual wall of the engine into the fuel tanks and cause huge amount of difficulties. So they wrapped it in titanium to prevent that. Now, it sounds to me this engine was still running, although it could have been running at idle. So here's the sort of things that you'll find the people assessing this incident we'll be looking for. Stuck throttle. It's actually more common than you think. The throttles could be stuck. You can get a pen that drops down into the throttle linkage and it stops you moving the throttle. They could have been at idle, not being able to get that throttle forwards. Rare could happen. Throttle linkage failure. The throttle that links itself to the fuel control unit to put fuel into the engine, that could have just fallen apart, could have been it's an old airplane, anything like that could have been damaged. Maybe that throttle just was not able to give them any power. But it looks like they're in a, what's that, a 30 degree left hand bank turn. The wings are fully forward in about 16 degrees. Uh, maybe they've got high lift devices out. They're not throwing the jet around and then they leave. And that's of interest to me because they've got time. And a lot of time in jet flying, you don't have time at all. As you can see here, uh, both go separately. So whether, I don't think there's a command eject in the MiG-23. and the aircraft I flew, there was a command eject. One guy pulled the handle, both people left. But it seems like one guy goes here. The can that's the canopy coming off at the top there. I know, that's like a bird there, isn't it? So the canopy comes off. Uh, there's a the canopy. There's the first seat. So we'll, get the, we'll just circle that now so you can see what I'm talking about. So there's the canopy there. And then that's the first seat coming out, which could well be the rear cockpit it could be the the pilot there whoever's the handling pilot which i'm assuming is going to be uh dan probably in the front seat is like dude you get out the back and then that guy goes all right am i going to eject uh he goes and then we so we get that and then there's a couple of seconds later as the rocket going you can see that that rocket so it's popped out of the jet and then it goes bang that's it that's a that's a, a cartridge seat there bang second one out Obviously good. Generate the separation they need. You get the drogue chute come out the top. This thing here is a drogue. That thing there you can see. That's just going to bring out the main chute. Because it's below 10,000 feet, that main chute is going to operate straight away. Uh, so that drogue is going to bring the main chute out, sorry, straight away. And then you can see there's the main come out there. Bang. And the second chute there. Drogue. Bang. Now, the seats are also on like little parachutes, but I don't know where these Russian seats actually are. They may just fall to the ground. Now, you've got two guys there. And you can see the drogue still attached to the top of the chute there, can't you? That's fine. And then these guys, someone said they landed in the water, but it doesn't look like they did here at all. Let's quickly, briefly, so we don't drag this video out, just talk about your ejection decision. So, ideally, in the Hawkeye flew between two and 9,000 feet, around about 250 knots was the best way we could do it, with a positive vector up as well, because these seats don't, do this kind of crazy stuff they just pop you out so if you've got a negative vector a vector towards the ground you get to something called the world of pain but again that 30 degrees angle of bank is a serious thing ideally you'd want those wings nicely level and as i said a positive vector if you can which makes me think because those wings are not level they've got a hydraulic issue now if the engine has a hydraulic pump so once the engine's spun up the hydraulics move you cannot get into a military fast jet and go forwards back left and right you have a hydraulic lock because the powered flying control units that feed each one of the control surfaces from each side the hydraulics is not being pumped they're just locked Locked out, they're locked, and they are they are driven by hydraulics because the airflow over them at such high speeds means you wouldn't be able to maneuver them 
like you can in light aircraft. So you've got to have these powered by hydraulics. It comes off the engine. If the engine stops, you have a control lock, unless you have something like a ram air turbine, or maybe the secondary function of the TS21 compressor is to do with that. If you know that, guys, hit me in the in the uh, in the in the chat down there. Hit me in the um, in the comments, please, because I must admit I can't find a MiG-23 manual online. That is rare for me, and I do not have the time between me doing this, obviously prior to making this video, to ask my students if they have one, and they probably do, but I just had to put this video out. So it may be that um, that engine was uh, was was running down, and therefore the engine was running down, the hydraulics are running down. If the hydraulics are running down, they have no control. They cannot move that aircraft level before getting out. So it could well be that. It could be, of course, controls jammed. Again, it's rare. Could be that something's moved in the aircraft. They've jammed the controls, and he's like, "I've got no control." Either way, I don't. I wouldn't see why they'd be leaving an aircraft at that bank angle if they had hydraulic control to actually make it proper and put the nose up because of the nature of the ejection seats they were flying. My seats were rocket assisted. It went out the aircraft, and then whoosh, massive rockets took me clear of that, so I could escape inverted, 250 feet at 420 knots uh, across the ground there, and about 500 miles an hour, and I'd be safe. But if I had five degrees inverted nose down, I'd be killed. That's 250 feet, guys, 500 miles an hour inverted. I'd be safe in my seat. Five degrees nose down, I'd be killed. That's the kind of tolerance levels we're looking at. Look, it's quite a long video anyway. I hope that helps. Um, and the other thing is, where are you going to leave this aircraft? Where is it positioning? It looks quite high alpha to me. You've got no way of knowing where this jet's going. Anyone saying they steered this jet to safety, I'm sorry. This jet is not being steered to safety there. Maybe they've seen a field and they've gone, you know what? That's the best we've got here. I'll stay with it a bit longer, see if I can maneuver the rudder around a little bit, you know, anything like that. See if I can get any hydraulic control back. At some point, you've got to get out. And note the height. They don't ride this thing in and get out even lower. They're getting out what is probably a thousand feet here, guys, because they know the limitations of the seat. This is not the best ejection seat in the world not the best ejection seat in the world. So you get out. If there's any doubt, you get out. Anyone that says that you ride the aircraft in or you try and avoid the school as a jet mate, that's not the truth. You'll get some jet pilots down here at Olden Bowls going, well, I would have saved, I would have rode it. Yeah, I get it, dude, I get it. But we train in the simulator for these kind of events. And if you do that in the simulator, they will chop you, they will sack you. It's not about that, it's about saving you. You're worth a lot of money. If the jet is uncontrollable, you get out. If there is doubt, there is no doubt, you get out. That's just jet flying, guys. I hope you appreciate the video. I hope it kind of lent something into it for you there. I do appreciate Tim Davies' fast jet performance.